Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, Big Energy Data and the Sustainability Factbook. We're very happy you could join us and are excited to share today's content. My name is Jess Van Marin. I am a Senior Product Marketing Manager here at Workiva, and I will be hosting today's webinar. Today, I'm also joined by Francis Quinn, Eric Becker, and Alastair McDougall. Francis is the Director of Sustainability Technologies at Workiva. Eric is Vice President at Urgenet, and Alastair is an Industry Analyst at Verdantix. Our webinar today is scheduled to last 60 minutes, and there will be a time for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, but before we get started, I would like to take just a moment to review a few technical details. Please take a look at the arrows on the screen. These arrows point to the location where you can ask questions. Submit any questions you have throughout the event in this box, and we will address at the event end of the event. If you like, you can expand the presentation slides by clicking on the Expand Slides button here in the right-hand corner of the presentation deck. I also wanted to let everyone know that this webinar will be available on demand and posted online after the event. So if you would like to review or share today's content, you'll have that opportunity. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Alastair, let's start with you. Okay, great. Thanks, Jess. So just briefly, a little bit about Verdantix for those of you uh, that do not know who we are. We're an independent analyst firm focused on energy, environment, health and safety, and sustainability. We were founded in 2007, and we have offices in London, New York. And our focus on energy, environment, health and safety, and sustainability is one of the reasons why we're speaking on today's uh, webinar, as we really look to address the importance of big energy data and how that plays into sustainability within corporates. So looking at today's agenda, I'm really looking to go through two main aspects. The first being the increasing importance of sustainability reporting within corporates. And then the second, why firms should take a data-driven approach to sustainability reporting. So let's jump straight in, in terms of the increasing importance of sustainability reporting. Well, here at Verdantix, as part of our ongoing research, we conduct and publish a number of surveys and we do these on an annual or biannual basis, and we do one dedicated on energy, one dedicated to environment, health, and safety, and then one dedicated to, to sustainability. And these surveys cover a broad range of topics from governance structures to budgets to investment criteria. And I'm sharing with you on the screen here some insights and data from both our 2014 and 2012 study. Our 2014 data hasn't actually been published, so you're all getting a, a sneak peek of that today, um, which I'm very glad to be able to share with you. And this question here is where we ask sustainability leaders in our interviews what they believe their CEO's perspective is on sustainability. And that's a really important person to determine what their attitudes are, is they really are responsible for driving a number of projects within firms, but especially new initiatives for, in some instances, such as sustainability. And what these results show is that this year, 28% of respondents believe that their CEO sees that EH&S and sustainability factors already impact their firm's annual and quarterly financial performance. That's up from just 21% in 2012. We also see that an increasing number of firms believe that the CEO actually takes more of a, a medium-term view on sustainability and EH&S. And it impacts non-financial metrics. One of the most important takeaways here is that we're seeing this increasing focus on sustainability in more of a real-time manner, more looking at quarterly and annual performance rather than maybe appreciating that sustainability is something which will happen in the long term or, or something we'll get around to addressing when it really matters. Firms are beginning to understand where it matters today and more importantly, they need to act today. And actually, Probably the, the best result that we found from this question is if you look at the bottom of the chart there where only 3% of respondents felt that sustainability was a relatively new concept to their firm and that they were grappling with what it actually means. So why, why are we seeing this increased focus or intensity around sustainability 
information and reporting. Well, one of the reasons is the fact that government and stock exchanges are really ramping up the rules and regulations around sustainability disclosure. So firms are coming under increasing pressure to report on that information, whether they like it or not. And this is causing challenges for firms that previously have not considered some of those aspects or don't actually know where to find that data even if they try. And it further adds to the complexity if you look at large global corporates which really have to deal with different regulations and rules and requirements across a large number of geographies. This further adds to the headache and, and this really is what our global research is identifying. And again, when <clears throat> we see governments and stock exchanges putting in requirements for more information, this has also resulted in organizations such as the Global Reporting Initiative, SASB, um, or the IIRC to develop frameworks which will help firms report on non-financial data, so data associated with sustainability and non-financial metrics. There's also other areas such as the CDP or the UN Global Compact, which corporates may wish to be able to report to or participate in. Again, this further adds to the reporting requirements of what information is required for one report, what information is required for the other, what frequency do I have to report on. So again, firms are coming under increasing pressure to be able to manage all of these requirements that in some instances really find that they're not set up to do so at this moment in time. And this isn't just me talking about regulation and hypothetical scenarios. We're seeing this actually happening. And if you look at the data here from the GRI, which uh, details the number of firms writing GRI reports and submitting them to the GRI, we see that between 2004 and 2012, the number of reports submitted has increased at 31% annually. This shows that firms are embarking on sustainability reporting and doing it through an actual framework rather than maybe putting together some material which they think uh, particular stakeholders might be interested in. And we see here as well North America, which was slow to, to take up sustainability reporting, but really is showing good strong growth at the moment to mark other re to match other regions as again sustainability really starts to take grip within North American corporates. However, what we actually see and why firms are really starting to take an interest in this is the fact that we're currently in voluntary reporting stage where firms are not under as significant pressure to really report on that information. But this is moving to mandatory disclosure. And once you get to mandatory disclosure, firms begin to realize some of the risks associated with non-reporting, but also reporting data of insufficient quality. So that really brings me to the, the second part of, of my material today, which I'm going to speak through, and that's why firms should take a data-driven approach to sustainability reporting. Well, as I was mentioning at the end of the first section there, that once we move toward mandatory reporting, the risks associated with weak non-financial reporting really do start to come to the top and become prevalent, and corporates are aware of those. Well, at least those which are taking a forward-thinking view of the market. And we see, for example, lenders refusing to provide loans due to lack of sustainability governance. This will impact top-line growth and the balance sheet of corporates. Greenhouse gas data that does not meet new regulatory demands. This will result in fines, penalties, and potentially reputational damage. I mean, there's a large number of people out there that like nothing more than to sink their teeth into a juicy story about a firm, a big corporate, which is not being in compliance. The inability to communicate on ESG risks to investors. Again, this can result in access to some of these investors being blocked, as they do not appreciate that your organization is fully taking into account the risks which it faces as, a new, as an organization in this ever-changing world. And also, falling behind competitors in terms of sustainability communications. This puts out into the market uh, a message of a lack of innovation and risk management. Again, this plays on the minds of not only the attitudes of investors, but other important stakeholders such as employees and also customers. So again, what, what are firms actually doing about this? So we asked 
the sustainability leaders which we interviewed, uh, how likely are their requirements to improve a number of processes in the next 12 months? And they range from water to waste management to procurement. But the, the, the ones I've pulled out here are those which are more so associated with sustainability reporting and data management. And we see here that 83% of firms think it's very important or important that they improve their corporate sustainability reporting. And this is closely followed by sustainability communications, their certification to external standards, but then also the assurance of these sustainability reports and management systems. So to give that hallmark that this is high quality data which we've sourced and we will back the accuracy of this information. And again, we ask firms how their budgets are likely to change for a number of factors. And we see that as firms believe it is important that they improve these processes, they're also expecting to see their budgets increase to allow them to invest internally, but then also in terms of tools and products which can help them really transform how they're reporting their sustainability information and capturing all of that data. And when we asked sustainability leaders about what topics are most important for their organization from a sustainability perspective, energy management really is near the top of the agenda. So we see here from the data that 90% of respondents believe it's either very important or important that their organization improves their energy management practices. Unfortunately, that's, that optimism is not uh, reflected in the budgets. We see that only 48% expect to see an increase in budgets. However, this does show that firms are increasingly investing in energy management, and some of that investment is coming from sustainability teams, but equally it will come from operational teams and facilities teams. And during the, the survey, we also wanted to make sure we weren't canning too many um, or forcing people into particular buckets. So we asked an open question for firms just to to let us know what their top three areas of sustainability are that will create the biggest risks and opportunities for their firms. And 39% mentioned energy as one of those top three areas. And this shows which, that firms really are seeing energy management as a key risk or opportunity when it comes to their sustainability management strategies. And, and why is this? Well, one of the reasons behind energy management being such an important area is the fact that there can be significant cost savings associated with managing your energy appropriately. And these are quantifiable savings. <laughs> these are actual savings where your bills go down and you spend less money. This all happens without impacting your organization. These are results which you can communicate back to others within the organization, whereas, for example, reputational benefits or increased sales of product through a better sustainability reputation are somewhat harder to quantify. Equally as important, but harder to quantify. And that's why a number of sustainability leaders really are looking at energy management. You also have the compliance with legislation. So again, as carbon regulation or other energy legislation comes out, sustainability teams are being tasked with ensuring compliance towards that. And again, they realize the importance of energy data in their ability to ensure compliance. And flipping over to the energy leaders now and, and where sustainability leaders should get their sort of inspiration from if they want to actually improve energy management within their corporates. When we interviewed 250 energy leaders as part of our Global Energy Leaders Survey, we asked them, again, how important it is for them to improve a number of energy management processes. And it's great to see that energy data collection and reporting really was the top priority, with 96% deeming that to be very important or important. The reason why we're so happy to see that result is the fact that there's a number of firms out there which may invest in energy efficient light bulbs or solar panels at one of their sites. That's not really an energy management strategy. That's identifying one opportunity and taking that and then potentially doing a press release around it to try and show that you're considering energy management and you're a sustainable organization. Firms which are taking this, uh, the proper approach to energy management and sustainability 
are reviewing their entire portfolio, their entire operations, to review which projects make the most sense at which facilities. Where do, can I make the biggest improvements for the smallest amount of investment to ensure that I achieve buy-in from the entire organization? And firms can only really do that once they have the data at their, ha at their fingertips to identify the opportunities, but then also build the business case. So we really do see that the beginning stage of any effective energy or sustainability management program needs to be the centralization of that data and the ability to analyze that information. So just to finish off on, on the material I'll be going through today, I just want to go through some of the benefits of using an automated data collection and management uh, strategy rather than using the most commonly uh, based piece of uh, software for managing sustainability data, which is uh, good old Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. And the first one will be time commitment. The time commitment required to contact all of the individuals from all of your sites, which are responsible for keying in all of the information around uh, energy consumption or sustainability, is high in time commitment. It requires a lot of time, especially once you have to start chasing individuals as they haven't sent you that information. With an automated solution, this is all happening in the background. The data is being collected as it becomes available and is available to you whenever you log into the system. The second benefit is in terms of accuracy. We all suffer from fat thumb syndrome every now and again. We all suffer from lapses in concentration, which can result in, when you're capturing data manually, mistakes making their way into a data set, which actually proves to be very important when someone like the CEO, CFO, or CSO is starting to make some significant decisions. Automated solutions have checks in place to make sure all information is valid and accurate as it's going in. And for anyone that's reviewed the, the CDP responses for a number of the, the world's largest companies, you'll fully appreciate what I mean in terms of poor data accuracy when it comes to sustainability information. Flexibility. Organizations are constantly changing, and with that, you need your sustainability reporting requirements to change. Maybe changes in KPIs or how you structure your reporting. Doing this through Excel requires you again to reach out to all of the individuals and retrain them on what information they're supposed to be capturing. An automated solution allows you to make centralized changes which updates everything automatically. The granularity of information. So again, due to the time commitment, firms choose to capture the bare minimum data that they require to satisfy their requirements today. With an automated solution, you can capture all of the information, regardless of whether you need it today, to ensure that if you ever need it in the future, there's a backlog of information there ready for you to be able to go in and interrogate. The this leads on to value add. Again, with the granularity of information, the, the accuracy issues, and the time commitment, really doing any sort of analysis using Excel is a labor-intensive task. Again, with an automated solution, the information's all there for you to analyze as and when you require, and to run some quite deep analysis on that data to start identifying trends. The reporting period, for all of the sustainability leaders out there in charge of reporting, you'll know that annually is enough uh, when you're doing it via Excel, due to a number of the reasons I've mentioned there. Whereas, when you've got an automated solution, it, you can choose to review it weekly if you wish, as long as you've got data going in weekly and it's getting updated or you can provide monthly update reports, quarterly reporting, and also feed into your annual reports. And the final one really is cost in terms of all of these factors mean that managing it through Excel spreadsheets is a high cost, whereas automated is, is lower in terms of cost. And some people can disagree there, but what I ask is to imagine how you would like to do your sustainability reporting, how frequently, how granular, and how accurate and then imagine how much it would cost you to do that using Microsoft Excel spreadsheets rather than an automated solution which can really streamline a number of these processes for you. So that's all from me today, and I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A section at the end, and I will just hand over to Francis. Thank you very much indeed, Alistair. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I begin, let me very briefly tell you about WorkEva and what it is that we do. WorkEva was founded in 2008 and has pioneered a cloud-based and mobile-enabled platform for enterprises to collaboratively compile, report, and analyze 
critical business data in real time. Our secure software platform called WDesk allows users to integrate and control all of their business data, regardless of format or location, with innovative live linking technology. Our proprietary integrated word processing, spreadsheet and presentation applications that are built upon our data engine allow anywhere from tens to even thousands of users to collaborate simultaneously on data link reports and documents. We offer our customer solutions for compliance, sustainability and management reporting, as well as enterprise risk management. Underlying these solutions is our scalable enterprise grade data engine that collects, aggregates and manages our customers unstructured and structured data that is both numerical and text data. WDesk allows users to work anytime from anywhere as long as you have an internet connection. And to date, well, we've provided our solutions to more than 2,100 enterprise customers, including over 60% of both the Fortune 500 and Fortune 100. Our customers span a large variety of interest industries, and we're proud of our exceptional customer satisfaction as evidenced by our 97% customer satisfaction score, which is customers that are either satisfied or extremely satisfied. Now, as all of you listening today have heard from Alistair, sustainability is a new and advanced approach to assess the vitality of companies. It's becoming increasingly relevant on a global scale for the in-depth evaluation of investment and development opportunities. Sustainability, in fact, is of paramount importance because investors, faced with the uncertain evolution of the global financial crisis, are now looking to evaluate not only the short-term financial performance of companies, but also their real viability. In other words, their ability to grow in the context of new challenges and manage new risks generated by our fast-changing world. And you all know what these risks are. You all know where the new opportunities lie. And I ask you, what company in what sector is not concerned by at least one of the following topics that we can see on the screen? Climate change, deforestation, wealth distribution, population growth, rarification of fossil fuel sources, water scarcity. These are topics that touch every company in some way, either as a risk or as a potential opportunity to grow business. Now, the sustainability approach permits analysis of a company's capacity to develop innovative technologies adapted to our ever-changing world, to secure their access to raw materials essential to their business, but also to manage economic recession trends and their impact on sustainable consumption of goods and services. Furthermore, it's critical that this approach be considered by companies operating in emerging countries, such as China, India, Brazil, where national values are strongly supported by local authorities and appear in the form of political pressure framing new social and environmental regulations. And if you don't believe me, just ask firms like L'Oreal, ask ExxonMobil, ask Walmart, GlaxoSmithKline, UPS, HSBC, there are examples everywhere. So the rationale behind sustainability creates a new paradigm for business reporting in the 21st century with direct consequences on how business viability and growth potential are evaluated. So given this context, it's hardly surprising that we have seen a very logical shift in the components of the market value of listed companies, for example, such as those in the Standard & Poor's 500. In fact, the value of a listed company is increasingly being measured in terms of their intangible assets. The intangible assets composed of intellectual capital and relationship with stakeholders, primarily. So questions such as, how good is your reputation? How much goodwill or trust does the, your operations generate amongst your stakeholders? How well do you understand and manage new risks and opportunities? Can you innovate? Are your innovations and new products and services, are they safe, are they ethical? These all become really important questions for determining market value, and the sustainability report is a great way to evaluate all of this. Now the good news is that the question that we used to ask in the past, whether to report or not to report, 
that debate is over. Sustainability reporting has gone mainstream, both here in the United States and all around the globe. And in fact, it doesn't matter what sector of activity you're in. Irrespective of that sector, if you consider yourself to be amongst the 100 leading companies in the world in your sector of activity, and you're not writing a sustainability report today, then you are in the minority. And we'll have to explain to stakeholders why it is that you're, no lo you're not capable of following your peers. The slide on your screen illustrates the evolution in the topics presented in sustainability reports over the past 20 years. And what we can clearly see is that the content of sustainability reports has changed, has evolved considerably during that period. As both the expectations and the diversity of stakeholders has matured, there's been a clear shift away from reports that used to focus almost exclusively on environmental issues towards reports that today also deal with issues related to the sustainability of the business model, organizational resilience, corporate responsibility, governance and ethics, and so on. And of course, how all of those topics support the growth of the business. The sustainability reporting chain, therefore, is the group of departments, facilities, sites, affiliates, subsidiaries, partners, distributors, suppliers, customers, all of those folks that comprise a company's global reporting network as it relates to environmental impact and societal responsibility. And as Alastair mentioned, with increasing industry regulation and the growing importance of managing risk in a proactive manner, Organizations now realize the necessity of collecting, analyzing, and continuously monitoring their data, and as well, of reporting that data to their many stakeholders. So in other words, it all starts with the data. Data, data, data. Now, local operational teams that manage the collection and analysis and validation of the sustainability data in particular areas, like environment or health and safety, obviously these people are directly involved. But the process for collecting the data is generally either manual or semi-automated and may use spreadsheet templates or data from an enterprise system. Typically then the information is rolled up into internal reports for local, weekly or monthly reporting. Data from local operational teams are subsequently consolidated by corporate operational teams across the entire organization for inclusion in quarterly environmental compliance reports, monthly or quarterly operation reviews, or annual reports at a corporate level that include, obviously, the sustainability report itself. For, for sustainability reporting, WorkEva has developed the Sustainability Factbook to help companies looking to manage challenges of modern sustainability reporting, including, of course, energy footprint. Now, if we put it at its most simple, a fact book is the company's trusted data ecosystem for sustainability reporting. It provides companies with nimble control over all their sustainability data, where it is carefully controlled and managed through a combination of permissions, audit trail, data lineage, and verification. It's what I like to call data governance. The fact book is the single source of truth with the extra layer of data governance. Companies, of course, should collect, analyze, and verify data on a regular, ideally monthly basis. By doing this, the fact book can support monthly progress reports, performance scorecards, quarterly EPA submissions, website updates, quarterly risk and board reports, and even ad hoc report requests, such as RFP submittals to win new business. It also supports KPI progress reviews, dashboards, scorecards, as well as external facing reports like CDP submission, DJSI, and of course, GRI and many others. As I said, it creates one source of data truth that ensures data disclosed in multiple documents are always the same, and this significantly reduces errors and version control issues, and of course, saves considerable amount of time. The fact book is an emerging trend for companies as people are really starting to understand the need for collecting and analyzing data frequently and establishing a single source of truth through proper data governance. 
Now, as you can see from the diagram, there are several ways to input data into the fact book. The first way is to manually enter data whereby an account administrator can assign different sections of the fact book to subject matter experts to manage and populate. Secondly, we can bring data in through WDesk Sync, which allows data in an Excel spreadsheet to be synchronized and imported directly into the fact book. Or alternatively, if the data set is not excessively large, we can use a simple copy paste. The third way is to link data directly from the data collection templates, which is what you're looking at on your screen right now. Our data collection product allows our customers to collect and manage unstructured data. And that is data that lives outside of an ERP or a sustainability EHS database. And this kind of data, this unstructured data, it generally resides in someone's desktop or laptop computer. And that data can be in a variety of different formats, such as Word documents, PDFs, PowerPoint presentations, spreadsheets, it doesn't matter. And remember, when I say data, I mean both numeric data and text data. So here on the screen, we can see granular emissions data from a plant in Mexico that have been collected using a template, and they have been directly linked into the fact book that you see here on your screen. The entire process is automated and, as Alistair said, goes on in the background. At WorkEva, we leverage Urgenet's expertise to extract data directly from utility sim systems and provide it in Excel format. This is typically a large data set that can be aggregated daily, weekly, monthly. It all really depends on the customer's needs. The data here is large utility, energy, water data. It's usually very hard to aggregate accurately and present in a human readable format. In the fact book on your screen, we're, we are using this to get monthly power and surface water data. The data is included into the fact book with WDesk Sync and then will be aggregated to get the monthly totals. Now, once linked out to the total section, we can create quarterly and yearly totals. And from the fact book, these values are linked out into any number of other outputs that we can see them here on the right-hand side of your screen. And these outputs may be for internal consumption or be externally facing. So for example, we can see that the utility power consumption data is linked into the scorecard as one of the main environmental KPIs. That said, we can also, it is also linked out into the CSR, annual report, the DGS, DGSI questionnaire, as we can see here on the screen. In this example, again, we're talking about the same data, remember. We have quarterly energy data that's linked out into a quarterly operations presentation. As I said, once the data is in the fact book, it can be normalized and aggregated, sliced and diced, and in whatever way you like, and then linked out to all of the different reports, presentations, dashboards, questionnaires, and RFPs. So when I think about the future, and companies facing up to the challenges we looked at earlier, I think about the role of the Sustainability Factbook and how it can support risk management as well as the sustainable growth of business. Being able to close the books on the sustainability data set in real time will be essential to timely communications and an enormous improvement over the many-month delay in data availability that currently exists. Let's be honest. We all know of companies that can spend months, literally, collecting and consolidating their utility data in a desperate attempt to determine where they stand in terms of footprint, but also to craft that operational performance into some sort of a meaningful, timely communication to stakeholders, whoever they may be. And WorkEva's partnership with Urgenet will go a very long way towards automating and streamlining that process. Our real-time, high-quality data management system will enable companies to track lagging indicators of performance and leading indicators of risk, and therefore manage the business more precisely, more sustainably. 
in addition to the unstructured data challenges for companies that can be solved with cloud-based, nimble data collection templates, sustainability platforms will support the integration of multiple data sets into the fact book. So, for example, to develop an integrated report, financial data must be linked into those reports. The easiest way to do this is to have the data links between financial data stores and the sustainability fact book, but also for the fact book to support linking into financial reports. For internal operational and progress reviews, including reports to the board, it will become increasingly necessary to link together financial, sustainability and risk management data to help drive business strategy and link to financial performance results overall. And in today's world, the key is that this has to be done as a real-time process. So at Workiva, we're very excited about our recent partnership announcement with Urgenet. This partnership will allow Workiva customers to tap directly into Urgenet's energy data, utility data, collected from more than a thousand providers. Embedding Urgenet data in WDesk will allow our customers to streamline the collection and management of utility data within the sustainability fact book, which helps companies to monitor performance, reduce utility costs, and minimize their carbon footprint. But I would say more importantly, it would also give executives the power to make energy use decisions based on real-time data and helps the sustainability office bring more value to the CFO. And having said that, now I'd like to pass over to Eric, who's going to talk more about Urgenet and some of the really great initiatives they've been engaged in with their customers. Thanks, Francis. And thanks, Jess, to you and the Workiva team for including us in the webinar today. Energy and sustainability are big topics, and we're excited to participate. If you need any evidence of just how big a topic sustainability has become, look no further than the logos on the screen. Coke, Target, Microsoft, and Nike, and virtually all the Fortune 2000 companies that we talk to have ongoing sustainability initiatives. And it's not just commercial organizations that are talking about sustainability. Many of you have probably heard about Mayor de Blasio and his pledge that New York City will be making very significant cuts in energy spend and improvements in sustainability in the coming years. And now Boston, Chicago, and cities all across North America are following suit. So what's driving all this? Well, we've talked about the benefits of pursuing sustainability, but there's other reasons that organizations are doing this. Financial performance. As Francis already described, there's a very, very strong correlation between organizations that are pursuing sustainability and their financial performance, market capitalization, and stock prices. But also customer expectations. Alistair described already the reputational benefits that accrue to organizations that are focused on sustainability. And then finally, compliance. In certain markets, government, government regulations require organizations to be focused in these areas. So how do you make progress? What do you do? Well, it all starts with data. First, you have to collect the data. With the data in hand, you can begin to measure and analyze the data, and then you can drive action. You can drive action with fact-based fact decisions that allow your organization to optimize financial performance, elevate the brand, comply with regulation, and improve sustainability. So where does Urgenet fit into all this? Well, we focus on the data collection piece. We've built a technology platform that automates the collection of utility data and other forms of energy data. And with this data, our customers gain deeper insights and are able to make improvements in their energy management and sustainability initiatives. Our data provides value across the organization. It's used not only by sustainability professionals, but also by those in facilities and energy management, procurement, and accounting. We wanted to share an example of one of our customers, Cox Enterprises. You may be familiar with Cox, but they're the fourth largest cable operator in North America. They also own TVs and newspapers, and they operate Mannheim Auto Auctions and Auto Trader. They started an initiative several years ago that they call Cox Conserves 2.0, and they knew where the data was that they needed to power their dashboard. They just didn't know how to get it. It was coming from 30,000 different utility invoices that were being mailed to them every month from 190 different utility providers. Cox 
now uses Urgenet's automated data feed to replace that flow of paper. And now this information is not only driving their dashboard, but has also allowed their energy procurement organization to cut energy spend by 10 to 15 percent in certain deregulated markets. Our solution is a subscription data service available in four different products. Urgenet Utility Data, which is a stream of data from uh, uh, utility bill data from over 1,100 utilities around North America. And this includes up to 150 data elements and a copy of the bill image itself. We also provide Urgenet Meter Data, which is a day behind data delivery of interval and smart meter data sourced again from the utility. We also provide Urgenet Weather Data, which is a feed of weather information from 5,000 certified weather stations around North America along with a calculated weather sensitivity index for each of our customers' facilities. And then finally, Urgenet Alerts, which is a data feed that provides our customers with notifications of billing and usage anomalies. So that's a brief overview from Urgenet. Now I'd like to hand it back over to Jess for Q&A. Great. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Francis and Alistair, as well, for your presentations. Um, now we're just going to take some time and address some questions that came in from the audience. And our first question today is actually going to be for Alistair. And the question is, do cost savings in energy management tie back to stock value? Yes. <clears throat> um, great question and always one that pops up. Uh, most definitely, we, we see that they do. Uh, nobody is investing in energy management just for the sake of doing so. And I think Francis' uh, slide that he showed in terms of the, the importance of non-tangible assets in determining the value of a company is really prevalent. And when we see firms such as DuPont, which claim to have avoided $6 billion in energy costs since 1990, that really shows the impact energy management has because when we talk about energy management, we're talking about efficiency, reducing costs, and therefore either improving profitability or improving your opp opportunities around pricing to remain competitive in a market Essentially, maybe if you're competing against firms which are coming from regions such as India, China, Brazil, which maybe face some more manufacturing costs. So we definitely see that uh, firms which have strong sustainability and energy management strategies really are um, setting themselves up for the future, and that's reflected in their perceptions within the, the stock market. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll move on to our next question. Um, I believe this one can be directed to Eric. Has Cox Energy, has the Cox Energy program been validated by a third party? If so, what was the verified energy performance improvement over the past 12 months? Yeah, so um, in fact, they did have third parties come in to validate all this. They report this um, up through the CFO's office in much the same way they do various financial uh, uh, reporting. I'm not sure which organization they turned to do this third-party validation, but they have done that, and I know that um, they could probably cite some of the specific figures around uh, what their gains are in, um, in in energy efficiency. But I know, um, much like they're they're saving around 10 to 15 percent in energy spend in certain deregulated markets, they've seen similar similar improvements, especially in their Mannheim auto uh, uh, locations. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, the next question. We will go with Francis, and this question is about the fact book. It is, is the WDesk fact book standard or can it be customized? The, uh, the fact book is customized for, for each customer for the simple reason that no two companies are the same and in that companies collect data in different ways and therefore uh, they also collect data in slightly different, uh, with different processes, and report on different indicators. You know, as Alistair mentioned earlier uh, in, the, in the webinar, there are several different reporting frameworks that people report to, and um, there's not yet a standardization in what people report on, and more particularly how that data is collected. So we support, uh, we try to support our customers as much as possible by ha by giving them complete flexibility in how the fact book is structured, and then ultimately what they wish to report out on. But also remember that a key point of the fact book is is not just to handle data that might go into a report like a GRI or a CDP or a DGSI. It's all of the information that a company might use both to manage its operations internally and to report externally. 
And so we, we end up uh, systematically doing customization with our customers. But to be absolutely frank, it's a pretty straightforward process. As you, know, as you saw uh, during the presentation, the fact book looks and feels like a very, very familiar environment. And that's done deliberately so that it helps, to, helps people get on board, get them used to using it, and ultimately using it as the one source of truth for their data sets. Great, thank you, Francis. Uh, moving along, our next question is for Alistair, and it is, is it necessary for small companies, like a 10-people company, to do GRI reporting? Yeah, and, and this, is a, this is a great question, um, mainly because a lot of the, the research around sustainability reporting does show really that it's the larger firms which are taking the sort of the leaps and bounds in terms of that. And again, that's because of a number, a number of factors we've discussed today about reputation, benefits, etc. But really, I would ask the question, is it necessary for a small company to have a HR policy or a, por or a policy around recruitment and equality? It's the same when it comes to sustainability. Is it something which your organization values? It's something that you should look to do. And again, it doesn't need to be a full GRI report, but just to capture the information which is important to your organization and sustainability and being able to share that information. One of the reasons why small firms maybe wouldn't choose to do this in the past is, in the past is <clears throat> it required a fairly big time commitment. Again, solutions being offered by Wakiva and Urgenet are really starting to automate that process, reducing the time commitment and allowing smaller firms to, to have that information that they can share with their customers or do a little bit more analysis to see if there's any efficiencies that they can make through uh, energy efficiency or other sustainability practices. So whilst it, it's not necessary to do a full, flashy uh, GRI sustainability or integrated report, there's definitely value which can be found through that data. And that data should always be shared, I believe, with your customers and your stakeholders is when you've got that information, it does no harm to hopefully share the good progress which you're making. Yeah, and, and if, if I could piggyback on that, uh, Alistair, you're absolutely right, but I, I would also say that um, one of the things that we had when I was a chief sustainability officer at L'Oreal was that for customers, for, for companies who wish to have preferred supplier status, it was obligatory to have a sustainability report, not necessarily a full GRI report, but companies who were willing to sit down with us and talk about what they had reported on, why they chose their particular indicators, and where they were going. So telling your story and sharing your story with the other people in your value chain can help, as I say, in our particular case at the time at L'Oreal, to keep your name, your company name, on the list of preferred suppliers. Definitely something worth thinking about, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Eric. Is Urgenet utility data available outside of North America? Yeah, great question. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we've got, we're rolled out to about 1,100 utility providers in, in North America, electric, gas, and water. And that represents about 80% of all utility accounts. And we're now rolling out in Europe. So by the end of Q1, we'll be in 20 different countries across Europe with plans um, to enter South America and Asia. Great. Great. Our next question can be directed to both Eric and Francis. Um, how does the system enable or facilitate validation of data, acknowledging that not all human oversight can be automated? Well, I, I can just start with the first piece of that, and perhaps Francis can tag on. But, um, but yeah, so what we're doing in our data collection process, we've got about 125 different audits that we run on each piece of data that flows through the system. And so... Um, without going into the details of, of all those audits, is pretty substantial. And then what we find is um, applications like the Workiva application um, take that a step further. So Francis, you might comment on that. Yeah, I, I think the, I think the, the remark is, is a very good one. For sure, not all validation processes can be carried out in a completely automated fashion. Um, the, the objective of, of uh, our, our common platform is to enable that to be automated as much as it can. And so, yes, at Urgenet, they have an extensive program for audits to verify data quality. In the case uh, of WDesk, 
We have th we, we customize variances for cells where data is entered so that, and, the, and these of course can be set to whatever degree of tolerance um, people wish to help check for anomalies. Plus we have a full certification validation platform that's built into WDesk that allows for a chain of command to subsequently validate the data as it rolls up through the organization. But I would say where, where you get the, the most improvement in data validation is by having something that's intuitive, that's easy to use, so that people can adapt it easily, that takes a lot of the drudgery out of collecting and consolidating and analyzing these data sets. And by simply giving people more time to focus on the analysis of the data they've collected rather than just brute data collection, you get a better result. You get a better quality result. People are less stressed, they have more time, and you end up with a superior data set to work from. Great, Francis. I have, I have one more question for you. Can the FactBook be integrated with other existing energy man management services, or is it just with Urgenet? Oh, it, it, it could be integrated into, into other uh, existing systems. I mean, th the commonality here is, is Excel. Uh, w once a given system exports into an Excel format, a PDF format, or some sort of a Word document, or some sort of uh, you know data uh, data separated by commas format, then it can be synchronized into uh, WDesk and through WDesk into the Factbook. So the the field there is is quite broad. Great. Our next question is about utility data. Eric, this would be a good one for you. How hard is it to get good utility data, and what's the process that makes it automated? Yeah, well, as it turns out, it's really hard to get good utility data. I mean, it's such a challenging problem that there's third-party companies that have offices set up all around the globe with hundreds of people keying build data into database, build data into databases, and so um, that's the problem we've really solved by automating it. So, the process that our customers engage in when they use a service like uh, like Urgenets is that um, they send a, send us a list of the utility accounts they want to activate on the platform. And then all the manual processes that they were undertaking before all go away and are replaced with our automated feed. Great. Um, our next question is um, for Alistair. Why are sustainability leaders so concerned about energy when they have so many other things to be concerned about? Yeah, and it, it's one of the, the real reasons I, I feel sorry for sustainability leaders is they, they seem to have so many things on their plate and so many important topics to be concerned about. So, so why energy? Um, well, unfortunately, we do see firms taking a, a better approach towards sustainability, but there are a large number of skeptics still out there around the importance of sustainability and how that feeds into the sort of performance of an organization. And as I briefly mentioned earlier in my material, the beauty of energy management is the fact that it has that cost item associated with it. For each kilowatt hour of energy you can save, that is a saving direct to the business. And again, if, if you look at firms maybe in the retail sector, grocery retail sector, but are operating at 5%, 6% profit margins, a $1 saving is, is quite a good um, saving if you think about it in terms of the profit or the sales required to generate that profit. Once you start talking about $1 million, $10 million, $20 million, $100 million of savings, and you think about that in terms of the revenue required, you're suddenly getting to some very big numbers. And this helps sustainability leaders gain interest from individuals such as the CFO, the CEO, that start to appreciate it in a little bit more manner and think, oh, well, let's listen to some of the other ideas that these guys have around water management, sustainability packaging, procurement. So again, that's, that's where we really see energy management being a good gateway for sustainability leaders in terms of being able to show that this does actually impact the performance of our organization and maybe you should listen to us a little bit more in the future. So that, that's what we see as uh, being one of the key reasons why sustainability leaders like to, to try and make sure the energy issues are addressed uh, first and foremost. Great, absolutely. Um, now we're going to move on to a couple questions on the fact book. Uh, so Francis, this is for you. It's what kinds of data can the fact book handle? Um, for example, safety data, and then can the fact book then be linked out to other outputs other than GRI, CDP, and DJSI? Okay. Um, 
For sure. In today's webinar, uh, we were focusing um, exclusively on utility data, so water energy data. But in fact, uh, the fact book can handle many, many different kinds of data. Um, you know, other environmental indicators such as uh, recycling, rates of recycling or volatile organics, uh, emissions, spills. Um, um, safety data, for sure, that can be handled uh, very easily. That That's pure numeric data. Um, we also handle, you know, uh, philanthropic data, testimonials, as I say, data types that are not even generally in numeric format, uh, HR data, diversity, governance, ethics, all of those. Um, and also, let's not forget financial data. Uh, the, the, the system uh, also um, handles financial data with as much ease as it does the others and so allows you to, as I say, slice and dice and to normalize and present your data um, in whatever, whatever form that you like. To the question of uh, what other outputs other than GRI, CDP and DGSI, um, I presume that in this case we're, we're talking about externally facing outputs, but essentially Essentially, any document, uh, you know, um, we have formal partnerships with uh, those three organizations that we just mentioned. So it's, it's one of the reasons why we talk about them as, you know, as, as outputs for the, the fact book. But we also have um, we also have outputs that can be specific to given industries like the folks in oil and gas, like the folks in the mining industry or the folks in the textile industry. They have specific and um, they have specific uh, outputs that they, they like us to link the fact book too. And as I say, once again, um, my, my answer will have to be the field is, is wide open. Um, all that we're looking for are customers to challenge us with new outputs that we can link out to. Okay, thank you. Our next question is for Eric. Um, what does big energy data specifically include? And can you deliver water usage data? So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure, sure. Great question. So in the case of Billing data, there's actually a lot of information on a utility bill. There's, I think I mentioned earlier, there's 125 or 150 data elements on a single utility bill, and all that's provided in our feed along with a, a copy of the bill image itself. And, and, of course, this information comes out monthly. Now, when you start looking at meter data, you're talking about several, order, several orders of magnitude more information because you're talking about observations that are coming out sometimes in 15-minute increments. So um, massive amounts of, of usage and demand data when it comes to uh, uh, meter information. And uh, the, as it relates to your question about water, yes, the Urgenet service includes electric, gas, water, and sewer uh, data. Great. Um, we're running a little bit low on time, so I'm going to ask just a couple more questions. Eric, one more question for you. How can multiple departments within a company get access to your data? Okay, great. So the Urgenet service, we're really good at collecting all this information and delivering it to our customers uh, in, a, in a central data repository. It's really applications like uh, WDesk that are really powerful tools for ensuring that you know, users throughout the organization can access this rich energy data that we're collecting. Great. Thank you. And for our last question of the day, this will be directed towards Alistair. And the question is, what is the most significant benefit of an automated solution? The, the most difficult question um, <laughs> last. And the reason why I find this such a difficult one is for someone who spends their entire working life looking at the benefits of automating energy sustainability data and then what firms can actually do with that information, I just struggle to really understand why firms don't do this. Um, so when I'm pushed to try and pick out the most significant benefit, I really do believe it is having all of that information in one central location where you can really have faith that that information is accurate, first and foremost. And then the ability to really let all of your great employees loose on that information, allow them to go in and start interrogating that data, slicing it, dicing it, just as Francis has said, and, and look for the opportunities. And really, the, it means the benefits become almost limitless in terms of how you can treat that data, manipulate that data, and find the opportunities. So I really, I think that's the most significant benefit of an automated solution is it, it allows teams to, to have a great foundation to really start making some really important decisions, um, both from a sustainability perspective, but also really a business perspective. Business performance should always be at the heart of this, and, and that's where I, I believe the the most significant benefit is and just really 
unleashing um, individuals on that data to really allow them to go out there and find opportunities and, and make a difference to your organization. Great, thank you. We absolutely agree. Well, thank you to each of our presenters today for your time and your presentations, and thank you for <clears throat> thank you for the Q and A session. So we're about out of time. So I want to thank our audience for all of their questions. If we did not answer your question, or if you think of any questions after the webinar, please email us at webinars at workiva.com, and we'll be sure to get you an answer. This concludes our webinar. Thank you again for joining us, and have a wonderful day.